I wanted to welcome everyone to this breakout session on Hodgkin's lymphoma. This session will give everyone an overview of the biology as well as the current and future treatment options for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Some of you may remember me from last year's conference. My name is Sabina Vohan Miller. I'm a longtime supporter and a volunteer of uh, Lymphoma Canada, and I also serve as the vice chair of the board at LC. Before we start, I wanted to uh, acknowledge the land that I am on, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Kremp, who is a hematologist in the Division of Medical Oncology and Hematology at the Princess Margaret Hospital, and a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. He also works with the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care Committee to Evaluate Drugs, Cancer Care Ontario, the Hematology Disease Site Practice, Practice Guidelines Committee member, and Stem Cell Transplant steering committee member. Dr. Crump's research interest is in clinical and translational research in lymphoma with a focus on stem cell transplantation and development of novel therapies, as well as late effects of treatment. And for a fun fact, I was a, a research student with uh, Dr. Crump many, many, many moons ago. And um, so with that, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Crump for being here with us today and for giving us this overview on Hodgkin's lymphoma. Before we begin, quick note, there is a question and answer text box at the bottom of your screen. Um, please type in any questions you may have for Dr. Crump into the, the chat box and we will try and address them at the end of um, Dr. Crump's presentation. And with that, I will pass it on to Dr. Crump. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for um, taking the time to clear uh, time in your schedules to come and listen to my presentation. I'm just going to share my screen. I hope. Uh, so the topic of our um, uh, breakout session today is Hodgkin lymphoma, and I've been asked to cover some aspects of um, disease biology. I'll go light on that. It's getting late in the afternoon on a Friday. Uh, but talk about some <clears throat> current treatments and future treatments uh, for this uh, lymphoma. <clears throat> so we're going to review relevant lymphoma, bi uh, Hodgkin lymphoma biology. I'll tell you about um, new treatment algorithms that use PET scan to direct care uh, for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, I'll briefly touch on old treatment for recurrent Hodgkin lymphoma and tell you about some new things that are that are now available, and then how those new treatments are actually moving forward and being incorporated into frontline therapy. Um, and I'll tell you about some interesting uh, discussions of the, about late effects or toxicities from patients. And I don't have any financial in, uh, conflicts of interest. <clears throat> so this is kind of the scope of the problem of Hodgkin lymphoma uh, in Canada. These are uh, 2013 data, but you can see that compared to other more common cancers, um, like lung cancer and uh, breast cancer. Uh, fortunately, Hodgkin lymphoma is not very numerous, but it's well known actually that the lymphoma survivor population uh, in North America um, is very large. It's actually the largest so cancer survivor population um, after breast cancer. There's a few in things about Hodgkin lymphoma that are quite unique, and this is one of them. This is actually a disease of young adults. Uh, so these are data from the UK um, showing you two different subtypes of Hodgkin lymphoma. The, uh, the top curves are men and women with nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma. The lower curves are uh, a less common subtype called mixed cellularity. But, but what stands out is that um, the average age or the median age of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma uh, is in the late 30s, <clears throat> unlike other kinds of lymphoma that we commonly see at our center where the, where the average age is from 60 to 70 years. So that's really shone a light on uh, a lot of um, the considerations of treatment because of the burden of late effects that are borne by uh, patients with, uh, who survive Hodgkin lymphoma. So that features a lot into how uh, treatments are chosen and, and how conversations go in the clinic. So there's many things that determine the outcome of lymphoma. Uh, obviously the, the type of lymphoma matters and for the purposes of this 
the presentation will just tell you that we're talking about classical Hodgkin lymphoma where subtypes are probably not so relevant. Uh, but Hodgkin lymphoma uniquely has a favorable outcome amongst, amongst lymphomas. Uh, age matters, this thing we call performance status, which is the effect of the disease on day-to-day -day life, ability to work, ability to participate in regular activities of daily living, but also what other medical conditions uh, a person has when starting out on treatment, we call those comorbidities. <clears throat> uh, we're going to talk a little bit about stage and what, what do we mean by that. Um, I tell my patients that stage is really about geography rather than uh, something that's reflects the passage of time. Uh, so some lymphomas present at, with what looks like advanced stage disease, but that's just their nature. It's not because um, we didn't, we missed an opportunity to diagnose it at an earlier stage. Uh, I'll mention more about that. Uh, the size of lumps makes a difference in terms of risk of recurrence. Um, sites outside of the lymphatic system, so we call it extra nodal lymphoma when the lymphoma manifestations are in an organ that's not a lymph node, not part of the lymphatic system. And of course, treatment. Uh, so some brief definitions uh, that come up during conversations about how to manage Hodgkin lymphoma um, include response rate, uh, which is just the, the manifestation of people's symptoms getting better and their imaging improving as well. And now we're much more dependent on the use of FTG PET scanning to define response in this disease. Uh, so it's a little bit different than a CT scan. Um, in terms of, of how we go about measuring things and evaluating response. Uh, and for those who want to know granular details, we use a thing called the Deauville score, which refers to how much uptake of on the PET scan uh, there is compared to surrounding tissues um, uh, like the liver and the mediastinum. Progression-free survival is really what we're going to talk about a lot in terms of how effective a treatment is, because that's really the 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 current standard endpoint for clinical trials in lymphoma. Um, often you would think it would be survival that would be the main endpoint, but, but disease progression happens first, and sometimes people live a long time after progression. So what progression-free survival tells us is how well a treatment is controlling the lymphoma, how well it's producing durable remissions. Um, and an overall survival sort of speaks, speaks for itself. So I mentioned staging is like geography. The, st the uh, staging system for lymphoma was actually invented uh, to aid in the delivery of radiation, curative radiation treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma back in the 50s. Um, and it really outlines uh, where in the body enlarged lymph nodes happen to be. Uh, use the diaphragm, that thing that separates your lungs from your abdomen, as the dividing line between stage two, one or two disease and stage three. So both sides of the diaphragm, uh, lymph nodes in the large on both sides of the diaphragm or involvement of the spleen and as well uh, connotes stage three. And stage four describes the stage where the lymphoma has moved into or appeared in <clears throat> organs that are not part of the lymphatic system. So the liver, bones, and lung are the most common signs of that. Uh, so stage is not the only thing that's important in the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma, but it does dictate um, what treatments might be included or and the duration of therapy. So because there's many things that uh, dictate outcome of treatments uh, in many kinds of lymphomas, we put together those attributes into what are called prognostic scores or prognostic indices. So this is a very, um, this is a, a time-honored, uh, fairly old prognostic scoring system in Hodgkin lymphoma that was developed when patients were treated with chemotherapy in the 80s and 90s but it's, uh, it has stood the test of time. So the more of these variables that one has at the time of presentation, the higher the likelihood is that the, the lymphoma will recur. Um, so most, some of these are um, just descriptions of the patients themselves, uh, gender matters, age matters, and patients with stage four Hodgkin lymphoma do have a higher risk of recurrence. The other things that are really reflections of blood counts are probably telling us a bit about the impact of the lymphoma on the person uh, with regard to, um, so being anemic and having a high white blood cell count is telling us something about how the Hodgkin lymphoma is affecting the person, the things that the Hodgkin lymphoma is producing to make people feel sick. So we do use this as a, at least a prognostic guide in some circumstances. Clinical trials have been designed around the number of clinical of these risk factors that a person has at presentation to determine whether they have low risk or high risk disease, especially for advanced stage. Uh, 
So it's still something that we take note of in the clinic. I'm gonna talk really about two chemotherapy recipes in the, con in the course of my talk. Uh, and I've listed the, on the left-hand side, the names of the drugs uh, and the three recipes, or really the two recipes that are most important are ABVD, which, is a, which was actually invented in Italy, but was widely, has been widely adopted in North America as a standard for as long as I've been a hematologist. Um, BCOP on the, on the right-hand side is something that was in, uh, developed in Germany and is very commonly used in uh, Europe. Um, a more intensive regimen uh, that was designed to try to give better uh, treatment results. So ABVD has been, it was adopted to, uh, to try to minimize toxicities and escalated BCOP was developed to try to maximize um, remission and cure rates. And, and the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma represents a sort of a tension between those two things. Because as I said, many people with Hodgkin lymphoma are quite young and have many years of life ahead of them to have to um, watch out for and manage late toxicities. So what's the right chemotherapy regimen here? So lastly, I'm just gonna show you that, that we look uh, or tell, try to tell you how oncologists look at data. <clears throat> and we use graphs with these things on them called Kaplan-Meier curves. So we want to understand how a group of patients with lymphoma are doing, uh, whether or not one treatment is better than another, but not everybody has, treated, has started the treatment at the same time and not everybody has been, has been followed for the same length of time. So we have to use a statistical, um, some statistical techniques to evaluate one treatment versus another. And one way is to uh, generate these things called Kaplan-Meier curves, which take into account those two things that I just told you about. When did the treatment start uh, and how long have people been followed? Uh, and there are ways statistically of comparing these curves one versus the other. What we really want is for everybody's curve to be flat at the top everybody is up there as close to 100% as possible all the time. Um, uh, so, but we do have these techniques to allow us to make, um, draw conclusions about, uh, about the effectiveness of one treatment versus another. And in the course of uh, my talk, you're gonna see these curves and I'll, I'll tell you what I think they mean. Lastly, I think we, uh, we have these conversations in the clinic all the time. Um, what is the difference between remission and cure? So remission, I tell my patients, is how, you're, how you are today where you're, when you're in the clinic and we've reviewed your scans and your scans have showed no evidence of lymphoma. And that's the, the state of being on that day. We can't tell if a person has lymphoma or not, uh, but it looks like it's all gone. <clears throat> Whereas cure is really something that's gonna take the next 20 or 30 years to sort itself out. Um, sometimes these, it may seem obvious that these two things are different, but I've had many conversations where, where they can get mixed up a little bit. Uh, so everybody wants to know when they're going to be cured, but all we're able to tell you from one clinic visit to another or one CT scan to another or, is whether or not you're in remission. So when you're going to make a, uh, I was asked to comment a little bit about biology uh, and how that's relevant um, to the development of new treatments in Hodgkin lymphoma. I don't know if you can see my arrow, uh, my computer screen, but um, I pretend this is a clock. We're going to go clockwise uh, around this uh, figure to describe, um, to, to give some background in terms of the immune system and how we've learned in, in lymphoma, in particular in Hodgkin lymphoma, how important the immune system is. So down here with number one, we know that cancer cells, or at least some cancer cells, express abnormal proteins on their surface that should allow the immune system to recognize them, just like the immune system recognizes bacterial proteins or viruses. Um, so those cells that are the most important recognizers of abnormal proteins are these things called T cells that travel around looking for, for enemies to fight off. And we're hoping that one of those enemies is, is, a, is a cancer cell, that the immune, system, the immune system can actually do that. And we know they try, these cells traffic to tumors because when we take a tumor out, there's lots, of lymphoma, there's lots of T lymphocytes in those tumors. So what's supposed to happen is that the tumor is recognized by the T cells being foreign and the T cell kills it, which is really what's happening down here at the bottom. So ideally, that's what our immune system is supposed to be doing for us. Why does it not work so well in Hodgkin lymphoma? So this is the, the diagnostic cell of Hodgkin lymphoma. This is the second unique feature of Hodgkin lymphoma. The first one is young age. The second is that if we take a lymph node out of somebody with Hodgkin lymphoma, almost everything that's there is a normal cell. It's not a tumor cell. About one in a thousand cells in a um, in a lymph node of someone with Hodgkin lymphoma will actually be the, be the Reed-Sternberg cell, which is the, 
odd looking cell in the middle that I've just circled with my red circle. So those are the characteristic cells that define this diagnosis. And they're surrounded, you can see that they're surrounded by an army from the immune system that's just not doing anything at all. Uh, it should be attacking the tumor and it's not doing, it's not doing that. Secondly, the, well, we know that these uh, Reed-Sternberg cells do express a really important protein, which I've shown a picture of on the right-hand side called CD30. Um, so it's a cell that's, it's a protein that's actually expressed in some T cells as well, but it's a, a feature, a characteristic feature of Hodgkin lymphoma. So not very many tumor cells, funny looking Reed-Sternberg cells, all express CD30. And this fairly complicated cartoon is showing you that we've taken advantage of the ability of uh, of uh, biotech companies and scientists to design antibodies that will recognize CD30 on the outside of the lymphoma cell, on the outside of the Reed-Sternberg cell, and attach actually a chemotherapy drug to that antibody. So how this works is the antibody becomes a very efficient drug delivery system. It only sticks to cells that have CD30 on them. We're hoping that's just going to be these Reed-Sternberg cells. Once the, once the antibody is stuck to the cell, it gets taken inside, you can see it's kind of being um, eaten by the, uh, by the cell. It's internalized inside the cell and then the chemotherapy drug is released there and the, the sort of spindly looking thing in the middle of the cell is actually uh, to tell you that the drug that's delivered is something that interferes with cell division. So brentuximab vedotin is uh, becoming an important uh, treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma based on this exp a unique expression of CD30 in the, in, on the Reed-Sternberg cell. And we have now a, we have an antibody that will direct the chemotherapy uh, right to where we want it to go, resulting in cell death. But the most important, I guess, recent discovery is the fact that uh, we people have figured out why it is that the immune system is so asleep in, in the lymph nodes of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. So I showed you before that there's all these cells in the background the brown cells in the middle of the Reed-Sternberg cells, and they're surrounded by these inactive T cells. So our immune system has a, you know, an on switch and an off switch. So if the T cell represents the immune system in the middle of this picture, there's two different kinds of proteins that are expressed on the outside of the T cell. One that's going to turn it on and make it much more responsive to a foreign invader like a bacteria or maybe a tumor cell. But there's these other proteins called PDL1. Uh, and PDL2, which are actually there to shut off the T cells. So they can't overreact to whatever they're being stimulated to kill. So the parts of the immune system have these on switches and off switches to regulate our immune response to things in our environment, prevent autoimmune disease. But unfortunately, uh, tumor cells are able to, so this, this off switch, as my slide just shows you, it's called PD1. On the surface of Reed Sternberg cells, which are the lymphoma cells, these cells have also learned how to express a suppressor molecule. So they express PDL1. So the Reed Sternberg cell has a way of turning off the T cells. So if you imagine what's happening over on the left again, the T cells have arrived ready to, to eat the tumor cell or attack the tumor cell, but PDL1 and PDL2 expression by the tumor cell have stopped that interaction. So the cells are there and they're ready to go, but they can't recognize the Reed Sternberg cell. So People have developed antibodies that will actually interfere with that interaction. So PDL1, sorry, PD1 antibodies have become an extremely important part of our uh, armamentarium uh, in the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, and these have now become important therapeutics that I'm going to talk to you about later. So just when we thought that our immune system was letting us down, we now realize how important it is to try to be able to encourage the immune system to function normally um, in a setting of tumors like Hodgkin lymphoma. So to start with, of course, we go back to the, um, the, the original diagnosis on this, on this slide. I'm just showing you the pathology um, uh, or evaluation of a, a tissue biopsy used to be fairly simple. Pathologists would just look down the microscope, just like Dorothy Reed did 100 years ago, and describe those characteristic cells and give us the answer about what the diagnosis is. But there's about 50 different kinds of lymphoma, and they're now defined by not just how they look down the microscope, but by immunohistochemistry, which is the description of the proteins on the outside of the cell. We have many probes to look at the genetics, the inner workings of those tumor cells, um, and uh, sometimes even multiple genes all at the same time. 
So pathology is really important, and some of you might have actually experienced the, that there is a long trajectory sometimes between the presentation to the doctor and when the pathologists have given us an answer. Uh, sometimes it's not so easy to make a diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma. It often requires, the diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma often requires removal of the whole lymph node, an excisional lymph node biopsy, um, because it's difficult with small pieces of tissue to make a diagnosis. So we frequently have the, and patients have the experience too, of going back more than once to have a biopsy to be sure that we're, that, we're, that we know what kind of lymphoma we're, we're, uh, the patient is facing and what the appropriate treatment would be. And sometimes these biopsies are really, really important because they show us whether or not the tar a therapeutic target, like the expression of PDL1, like the expression of CD30, is actually present on the tumor cell. So we can actually use some of our new therapeutics appropriately and more effectively. Um, so excisional lymph node biopsy is really the standard of care for Hodgkin lymphoma. If a patient presents with a big lump in the chest or a lump in the abdomen, then, then a CT guided biopsy is uh, going to be necessary. <clears throat> but sometimes it can take a a bit of time and a bit of work to get this done, but it's really, really important in terms of giving us the, the answer as to what kind of lymphoma are we treating and, and how can we treat it better. Staging tests are the next thing that happens. As I said, this is describing the geography or, or where is the lymphoma. Uh, we used to just use CT scans, but really we're quite dependent now. And we think that all patients who are presenting with a uh, new diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma need a, uh, an FTG PET scan to really give us a, the appropriate answer as to where the lymphoma is. Occasionally, we use MRI to help solve problems. Um, we don't really do bone marrow biopsies anymore in, uh, to, to evaluate the bone marrow of somebody with Hodgkin lymphoma. Many other lymphomas, that's still an unfortunately necessary test because patients don't like to have them and doctors don't really like to do them. Uh, but if a PET scan is performed as part of a baseline assessment, then a bone marrow biopsy, at least for Hodgkin lymphoma staging, is not necessary. And on this list are other things that either tell us more about the effect of the lymphoma on the host. So remember in the international prognostic score, um, blood counts and uh, albumin, a, a protein that's found in the blood were important. So blood tests will help us with prognosis and they will help us with monitoring of therapy. Um, and some other tests might be required if we're concerned about um, how good somebody's heart function is, if we're using a drug that might affect the heart, uh, how good people's lung function is, because at least one of the drugs we use can actually, it has the potential to cause inflammation of the lung. Uh, so there are a number of other tests that, uh, that are done prior to starting therapy to make sure that it's going to be safe. This is just to show you what a, what a PET scan image would look like on the left-hand side. There are uh, many uh, dark smudges in places there shouldn't be, uh, including in the spleen. Uh, that, so that's the baseline scan. And then after treatment, you can see a lot of those dark smudges have completely disappeared. The, the black thing in the middle is, is the heart and the, it's not a lymph node. So the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma um, in the past was fairly uh, unsophisticated or uncomplicated. If patients had localized, um, early stage disease, stage one or stage two, so just one lymph node area, say in the neck or um, lymph nodes just above the diaphragm, which would be the typical presentation. Um, somewhere between two and four cycles of that ABVD recipe would be given, and then local radiation would be given uh, following that. Uh, if the stage was more advanced, if there was um, lymph nodes on both sides of the diaphragm, the spleen was involved, the bone marrow was involved, then it would usually be four to, sorry, it'd be uh, six to eight cycles of chemotherapy and, and only on occasion would radiation be used. I've just reminded you what the, the drugs are in ABVD at the bottom of this. So currently we've um, changed how we deliver treatment. We want to maintain or even improve upon the excellent remission rates that have been established with ABVD based chemotherapy, as well as reduce um, the toxicity of treatment in the hope that we can reduce long-term side effects. How do we make things better and less toxic at the same time um, uh, when we're using the same tools, the same chemotherapy regimens? <clears throat> so we want to avoid these um, uh, late complications if we can, but we don't want to sacrifice uh, remission or cure rate. So many centers on ours is one of them. You'll find is, is have adopted a PET adapted approach. Baseline PET scan tells us whether or not somebody has localized disease. And then we do a PET scan after two cycles of chemotherapy and ask what the response has been. If the PET scan is negative, if the patients have had an excellent response, 
then that's a situation where we could consider reducing treatment because uh, we know a negative intra PET scan has a very favorable prognosis attached to it. On the other hand, if the PET scan is still positive and we're still concerned about active disease, then really we need to intensify treatment or, or um, uh, change things to try to improve on outcome. And there's been several trials that have actually looked at using these approaches to see whether or not they come up, whether or not we can come up with better treatment of, uh, um, outcomes. Oops. Um, so <clears throat> this is an example really of how we treat limited stage Hodgkin lymphoma now. So at our center, probably 75% of the patients we see have stage one or stage two Hodgkin lymphoma. It can be divided into um, a little bit or a lot of uh, early stage lymphoma. I won't go into the details about how we make that distinction, but there are groups even within this favor, even within limited stage Hodgkin lymphoma that can be treated with more or less therapy. So how it looks these days is patients who would have two cycles of ABVD treatment, if they have favorable disease of, and they have a negative PET scan, and then the choice is to continue on with a bit more chemotherapy or include radiation um, in that treatment algorithm. If the patients have a bit more lymphoma, we would call it unfavorable uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, um, the treatment is, uh, the approach is the same. If the PET scan is negative, then we can either use four more cycles of chemotherapy and omit radiation, or we can just use two more cycles of chemotherapy and local radiation. So we're using this to, to help us make decisions around uh, duration of treatment with chemotherapy and who needs radiation and who could have radiation safely omitted uh, so that we don't see those late radiation induced side effects. Similar for advanced stage disease, there's a few choices here in terms of direction. Uh, certainly starting with ABVD and then uh, continuing along those lines is something that's commonly done. You can see that on the right-hand side uh, of this figure, I showed you what the progression-free survival, remember that was the that middle term of the described disease control earlier on in my talk, what that looks like three to five years after the completion of treatment. So we know that if a patient with advanced stage disease gets ABVD, has a negative PET scan after two cycles, we can leave bleomycin out we know, we know that bleomycin can cause lung inflammation and that's always something we want to avoid. There was a study that was actually done to show that it was perfectly safe with regard to um, remission uh, to leave bleomycin out, continue with another four months of chemotherapy. In many circumstances, we would start with a more aggressive regimen. In many countries, this is the standard of care. We would start with the escalated BCOP regimen um, in order to, and if the PET scan is negative, use fewer cycles of BCOP to accomplish um, producing a very high remission rate. So whereas once when this regimen was first developed, eight cycles of chemotherapy was the standard, now about 85% of the time we can just give four cycles, essentially half the toxicity, half the number of cycles, and still achieve very high uh, progression-free survival rates, over 90% on almost every study that's been looked at using just BCOP. A recent study from France actually um, tested whether we should just carry on with BCOP or actually de-intensify the treatment and switch back to ABVD. And that seemed to be actually an excellent uh, strategy as well. So produce a very high remission rate. Again, 85% or more of patients will have a negative PET scan. And, and those patients could have their treatment reduced in intensity, but not duration, uh, still maintaining a very high remission rate. I'm going to come back to this last regimen at the bottom here uh, later in my talk because it incorporates the new drug brontuximab vedotin into frontline treatment. And in a study that was uh, done in, uh, around the world comparing ABVD to brentuximab and AVD uh, with no PET adaptation at all, so people just got six cycles of chemotherapy, 83% of patients with the new drug added uh, in place of bleomycin essentially um, uh, without modification of PET scans. So by and large in Canada right now, um, PET adapted therapy is the standard for advanced stage disease. Brentuximab vedotin as part of initial treatment is available in the US and most countries are going to approve and fund this eventually, including Canada. So very good remission rates for patients with negative PET scans. What happens if the PET scan is positive? So we know that we can't just carry on really with the same treatment because we're not gonna have very good results if we do that, we want better results. So there are studies that have, that have tested intensifying chemotherapy, so switching from ABVD to BCOP. Um, if the patients are still on or started out on BCOP, then it would continue with that regimen. And frequently, if there are abnormalities at the end of treatment, radiation is added. 
So radiation and intensification with escalated B-copper is generally the solution for the patient population where uh, an early positive PET scan after ABVD is encountered. Um, I'm not a regional oncologist. I only have one slide or I have two slides actually about radiation. Um, so it's delivered by fancy machines that are on the right-hand side of this picture. Uh, the treatment for, for um, the use of radiation in Hodgkin lymphoma is really for localized problems, either at the end of treatment with, the pos with a, end of, a positive end of treatment PET scan for advanced disease, but much more commonly it's just used to, uh, together with chemotherapy in early stage disease. As I said at the beginning, Everybody at Princess Margaret with stage one and two Hodgkin lymphoma would have had radiation um, several years ago. With pet adapted therapy, it's more like about 25%. The treatment is given daily for four weeks on a Monday to Friday schedule, um, divided into these things called fractions to reduce the, the toxicity of the treatment. Uh, and the side effects that are associated with it, at least short term, are dependent on where exactly the radiation is being delivered. The radiation is very focused on one anatomical area, but if, if, for example, it's in the neck, patients may encounter sore throat or dry mouth uh, because of that. So this is really how radiation has changed, and I'm hoping my cursor, uh, my arrow works, uh, showing you uh, the difference between radiation as given now, which is defined by this red, this red box, it's called involved field radiation, if the, the purple lump here is a a lymph node mass just above the collarbone in this patient. This is what would be called involved field radiation, right, as given now. In fact, actually, the radiation oncologist would just radiate this node and a little bit of a margin around it. It used to be, though, when radiation was invented for Hodgkin lymphoma, that all of this, you can see this sort of funny uh, shape that's over top of this, uh, or the shoulders and neck of this patient, this box, that's called extended field radiation. That was really the curative radiation that was developed at Princess Margaret and at Stanford for Hodgkin lymphoma. So lots of adjacent lymph nodes were radiated and truly was effective at, at preventing disease relapse. The problem is a lot of normal tissue was radiated at the same time. So the late effects of radiation are really, right now, what you read about on the internet and uh, in books is, the consequence of radiation that was, that was given in the 80s and 90s, because it takes 20 to 30 years to follow up those, um, follow patients for those late complications. We don't give radiation that way very much anymore, we or at all anymore. We just give this involved field radiation. So radiation safety has definitely changed. And the studies that I just showed you that are pet adapted actually have, have um, allowed us to leave radiation out entirely in some patients. But these worrisome late effects definitely come up all the time in our conversations about what to do, especially in patients with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma. So the wide field or mantle radiation, upper abdominal radiation that I just described to you was definitely something that contributed to the incidence of second cancers 20 or 30 years after people had been cured of Hodgkin lymphoma. We know that can cause or uh, has caused problems with heart valves, uh, narrowed blood vessels to the heart or to the, in the neck, so causing heart attacks and strokes. So all of that was definitely a feature of the radiation that was given in the past. Chemotherapy was not so innocent in the past either. We used to use this regimen uh, when I first started in practice called MOP, which was well known for causing infertility in everyone and in an, a disturbing number of patients, uh, uh, secondary acute leukemia. We gave up MOP chemotherapy um, a long time ago, uh, but still it's something that features in conversations with patients about whether or not there's a leukemia risk related to the chemotherapy that's being given. So our current treatments is likely to do this. And I think the answer to that is no. So breast cancer risk in particular, because that's the one that seems to stand out as the second cancer of concern from, for women with um, Hodgkin lymphoma, is, breast cancer risk is significantly less now due to much better radiation targeting. And as I said, there are certainly circumstances where we just choose to leave it out altogether uh, if we knew that it was safe to do so. So lung and heart toxicity from chemotherapy is actually quite uncommon although we still monitor for patients for that. And leukemia risk from contemporary chemotherapy regimens like uh, ABVD and BCOP is actually really, really low. Um, so, and there's no obvious difference uh, in my mind between ABVD and BCOP with regard to that complication. So we spend a lot of time talking about these things because we know the Hodgkin lymphoma literature uh, has described some of these late effects in our survivor population. Um, but things are better in terms of toxicity. It is true though, that if patients are gonna get um, escalated BCOP as their, as their chemotherapy, and I showed you that it actually produces very, very good results in terms of uh, disease control. There's a lot of supportive care that needs to be given. So 
the anti-nausea drugs are augmented. We give three anti-nausea medications to prevent nausea and vomiting. Patients need to take antibiotics to prevent infections, uh, reactivation of uh, herpes viruses, oral antibiotics to prevent bacterial infections, um, and growth factor injections with filgrastim or GCSF to speed up white cell recovery. So it's a pretty complicated recipe. Uh, and I'd be the first to say that it's not easy. I don't think ABVD is easy either, but um, it is more intensive, but uh, um, some, some people feel that it's actually more effective. But certainly if people are running into problems with their blood counts or other toxicities, dose reductions are always warranted and can be put into place. So before I move on to the, uh, onto the future, I'm just gonna tell you that it's, you know, what doctors and their, and their patients want from treatment really varies. Uh, depending on the circumstance. So this is a really interesting survey that I'm gonna go through quickly uh, to tell you that, um, that uh, doctors and patients are often aligned in terms of what they want from therapy, but they may be, there may be some differences as well. So this is all hypothetical online discussions uh, between, uh, but it, would, it took place with Hodgkin lymphoma, patients who were recently exposed to chemotherapy uh, and those who are about to be um, experienced chemotherapy. And, and what these bars show you is that that depending on the toxicity, the toxicities are listed on the right here, um, people view them somewhat differently and patient preferences change depending on uh, several things, uh, how old they were, what their gender was. So along the bottom here are patient attributes. Um, and you can see that all the, although the colors kind of look the same, if you really drill down to this, we know that, that the priorities are different amongst patients depending on, on their station in life as it were and whether or not they'd actually experienced chemotherapy at all. One of the things that was interesting was that doctors also viewed patients differently in terms of the, 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 the side effects that they wanted to avoid and what they thought was the priority. And I'll draw my, your attention to the, to the doctor's view of older patients, which was they, they thought the physicians thought the best thing, the, the thing that was most important to older patients was to avoid toxicity, but it was actually the opposite. Older patients were actually the ones who were least likely to be concerned about toxicity they were interested in progression-free and overall survival. But things like fertility, lung toxicity, um, uh, other aspects like that really did change a lot depending on, on uh, who the patients were, how old they were, and what their situation was. So what happens if Hodgkin lymphoma doesn't work? Uh, sorry, if treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma doesn't work? This is my only slide about what's the standard second line therapy, because I think it's really gonna change it's because of these new treatments that we have. So. For young patients, autologous stem cell transplant is the best option. That's really a, a transplant using a patient's own cells to support them through a very big dose of chemotherapy. Uh, it's, been a it's a treatment that's been around for 30 years. Um, it's very effective in patients who have a very good response to chemotherapy, but uh, we know that it doesn't work um, uh, all the time. Uh, and at the bottom, um, realistically, remission rates are only about 50% at five years and patients have gone through this treatment. So we definitely need something better than an autologous stem cell transplant that right now remains the standard of care. Well, I mentioned Brent talks about Vidotin before, and this is a drug that's, uh, that was approved uh, in Canada and in all of the provinces for relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma after an autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, the patients who were in this trial had actually had a lot of prior treatments but about 75% of people whose lymphoma had been through many treatments, including an autologous transplant, um, responded well to brentuximab. And the figure on the right, the Kaplan-Meier curve that I introduced to you at the beginning of my talk, shows that about 20% of people who have just had this treatment after everything else has not worked, remain in remission out to, uh, after more than five years. So there must be something to this CD30 targeting that, uh, that we could maybe exploit earlier on in the course of disease. We know actually Five that, minutes. thank you. We also know that uh, um, uh, we can reduce the risk of relapse uh, after an autologous stem cell transplant by adding brentuximab vedotin as a consolidation measure. So this was a trial that was published a few years ago that showed that in patients who, would go, who are going through a transplant who are at high risk of treatment failure um, uh, could have their treatment outcomes improved by the addition of autologous stem cell transplant. And these are the Kaplan-Meier curves that show that. So there's about a 15% improvement from 50% to 65% by adding brentuximab vedotin in patients post autologous stem cell transplant. This is the randomized trial of the compared ABVD to AVD. Uh, there is about a five to 6% difference in progression-free survival. So we've now taken a drug that was just used in patients that had been through 
uh, many prior therapies that have relapsed after an autotransplant. We've used it to make outcomes after autotransplant better. And now uh, if we add it to stem to primary therapy, we can improve progression-free survival at least a bit, although overall survival is not yet uh, improved by, the, by this addition. I'm going to just briefly, in a, in a couple of minutes that I have left, uh, go back to the immune evasion. You remember this slide, I was trying to tell you that, that there's uh, proteins on the surface of the lymphoma cell that, that hide it from the immune system, and antibodies to that protein uh, have been developed to try to interrupt that. And so as it happens, there are two such antibodies, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, that are now available to treat uh, in Canada to treat uh, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma that's relapsed after many lines of therapy. These are kind of like Coke and Pepsi. They're both similarly effective. They both have a similar array of side effects. Uh, the details are on this slide, but the response rates are about 70% for both. Disease control is about uh, 13 or 14 months for both. Um, survival data is a bit immature, but both nivolumab and pembrolizumab are very effective in in treating Hodgkin lymphoma that, again, has been through everything, including brentuximab vedotin, all by manipulating the immune system. Um, I'll skip over the toxicities, although they're very modest with these drugs. They're usually, there's a mild degree of autoimmunity that happens. Sometimes lung inflammation, pancreas inflammation happens, but they're actually quite uncommon and they're very well tolerated. So what's better, brentuximab or, or pembrolizumab? And there is actually a randomized trial now that has shown that if we compare um, brentuximab vedotin to pembrolizumab in the patient population who've all relapsed after an autologous stem cell transplant or are un unable to, to have a transplant, it looks like progression-free survival with this immune, immune Im Im manipulation, antibodies targeting PD-L1, sorry, PD-1 on the, um, in this patient population produces better results. So at the bottom, you can see that progression-free survival uh, is uh, better with pembrolizumab than brimtuximab vedotin. Um, and it's now going to likely move into the, as the standard of care. So there is going to be, there are lots of initiatives that try to, to put these drugs together and to, to build better combinations of therapy. Um, uh, so we're, we're moving these agents farther into the, or up, up, up front in both uh, front line and the relapse setting. Uh, but all of these encouraging data of these new combinations require confirmation in randomized trials. So I'm just going to point out in my last 30 seconds that there is a, a study comparing the addition of brentuximab with AVD to nivolumab and AVD that's actually just uh, being launched in Canada in collaboration with our partners in the North American uh, intergroup. Um, so this will be coming hopefully to a hospital near you at some point in the future. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to end my talk there and show you one thing that you've not seen for a really long time. This is a Stanley Cup parade in the city of Toronto. Uh, we won't be seeing it this year, but maybe next year. Thank you very much for attending my talk and for, um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Great, Dr. Krem. Um, so we have a question here. I think we have time for probably one or two questions. The first question is, I am an 18 year old who has stage five Hodgkin's who had a complete remission after two cycles. I've never smoked or vaped. Is it safe to eliminate B from the ABVD cocktail? Uh, so it is safe. Um, this, there was a fairly large study done in the UK that, that uh, whose goal was exactly that. Um, so uh, we know that the outcomes, if, if you continue on uh, just with the AVD treatment for four more cycles, it's, uh, the results are just the same as if the bleomycin was left in. Uh, what we know is that 18-year-old uh, non-smokers have a very low likelihood of developing any problems from ABVD, uh, in particular from the bleomycin. So, uh, so it's safe to do so, and that's our practice as well, is to, if you've had a, if patients have had a complete metabolic response after two cycles, we leave the bleomycin out. Great. Um, while we're waiting for other questions to come in, I have a question for you. Um, I read a recent study by ISIS talking about how only 3.4% of women under the age of 40 were given fertility counseling before treatment. Um, what do you suggest for patients who are coming in in terms of pretreatment considerations and how to advocate and have these discussions? I definitely agree that it has to be on the list of uh, uh, things you're going to want to talk about. Um, so regardless of the regimen that um, is going to be recommended, uh, 
uh, fertility uh, preservation uh, is available, I, I will speak to Ontario. So the Ontario government will now pay for one round of, of egg retrieval. So that, that includes at least the physician fees and the technical part of it. Uh, getting There is coverage available for the drugs. The drugs are quite expensive. But, um, but there are a number of programs uh, around to support um, the drug part of this as well. So everybody has an opportunity to have eggs or embryos uh, frozen prior to starting chemotherapy. Uh, embryos might be the way to go if you have a partner, if you're already married, uh, but uh, the technology around egg freezing is also quite good. I, I'd say the only limitation really about that is, is uh, if people are very sick um, yeah. at the time of presentation of lymphoma, the big lumps in their chest, they have lung compromise, it may be, it may, may be challenging to do it because it takes about three weeks um, to get all of that done. So. Hodgkin lymphoma usually lends itself to that sort of uh, you know, small delay to accomplish this really important thing. So it's funded by the Ontario government and I'm pretty sure in most provinces it is as well. So it's definitely on the list of things to talk about. It's probably more important than hair loss, honestly. Great. Um, okay, ne next question coming in. I had seven rounds of ABVD for Hodgkin's in 2008. My chest x-ray show scarring. Could bleomycin be the cause? Uh, it could be. Um, without knowing how old you are and what other things happen, whether or not you smoke. Um, a long time ago, the Stanford people actually looked at uh, long-term survivors of um, uh, treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma, in particular radiation and chemotherapy, and found that there was, uh, you could demonstrate uh, changes in the lungs or changes in pulmonary function tests in a, in a fairly uh, significant number of people later on. So you may not be, some people are not aware of it, but, uh, but it's recognized that even many years out, uh, you can certainly see those changes. So provided that you don't smoke or have any or asthma or have any other underlying lung disease, it, it may well be related to the bleomycin. Okay, and I think we have question, we have time for one last question. Um, do we know why Hodgkin's affects younger population versus non-Hodgkin's? Um, I wish I was that smart. And I think the short answer to that is we don't. Um, uh, you can be, you know, you can be 85 years old and have Hodgkin lymphoma, but uh, uh, so nobody has really actually been able to figure that out. There is a relationship between Epstein-Barr virus, which is the infectious mononucleosis virus, and developing Hodgkin lymphoma. So about a third, if we test the tumor and look at the cells, the cells actually have evidence that the, they've been infected by Epstein-Barr virus. And just to let you know, like most people end up being positive for EBV at some point in their life. It's a very common virus. So there's that about a third of the time. And there's these really interesting data that um, from countries that have shown that um, there's, uh, if you measure, uh, if you take a bunch of blood from people who, who had just had infectious mononucleosis and you follow them about, there's about a three year time lag where you can, you can track that infection happened here and then lymphoma happened three years later. So it might be that it's just that, especially in the West, um, it's coincident with the fact that we acquire Epstein-Barr virus at a relatively early age, and we get it when you're a teenager in your early 20s. Um, it doesn't explain in North America why two-thirds of the uh, people with Hodgkin lymphoma don't have evidence of Epstein-Barr virus in their tumor, but at least in some people, it's probably causally related to a virus that happens early on in our lives, and maybe there's other viruses that are responsible too. People have looked at that. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Crump, for such a comprehensive and in-depth overview of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I am so grateful for your time and expertise today. So thank you for being here with the lymphoma community today.